uses simple things. That's the message title for today. We are in the book of Exodus, back there in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 17. Rather an interesting passage, very short verse, and yet it, it teaches us some important things that we have not yet looked at, even though we have looked at Moses' rod already. You remember verse 17, Thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs. What an emphasis God makes to Moses. God's going to put words in Moses' mouth. Moses is going to talk to Aaron and, you know, all that back and forth that we had in the preceding verses. But then God says, and you're going to do what I tell you to do, not just talk. It's going to be some action involved here in this situation. Thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs. God is not going to let Moses off the hook just because God is bringing Aaron into the picture as well. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the privilege, a true privilege, of being those who are used by you. You are a God who chooses and you are a God who acts. And you are a God who, when he commands his people to do something, expects them to do it. We thank you, Father, for the provision that you make for those who help, for other means that you use which are useful to us. But God uses people. And God uses people of his choice. And so, Father, we pray for the going forth of your word this day, that it would not return void, but that it would indeed accomplish those things which you please, and that it would prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now last week, of course, we learned quite a number of things that are here in this passage, some things that we usually don't like to think about. For example, God gets angry at believers. God's chosen people can make him angry. Things that make God angry include arguing with God, doubting God, being stubborn with God, implying that God is incompetent, lying or ignorant, telling God what he has to do, telling God what you won't do, and making suggestions that you think are better than what God has commanded you to do. Moses did all those things, and Moses got into serious trouble for even touching on those issues with God. The second thing we learned is that God works in families. He doesn't just work with us individually. And the final thing that we learned was if you make God angry, you may end up getting second best when he uses somebody else instead of just using you. Serious issues in that text from last week. And we saw that God was already working in the life of a family member, Aaron, the big brother of Moses. And Moses had been so focused on himself that he failed to see what God was doing in the rest of his family. And sometimes some of us fall into that. Americans tend to be introspective, selfish. They tend to be self-centered and focused on their own personal comfort, pleasure, peace, and prosperity. And we living in this society tend as Christian Americans to pick up a lot of the tenor of the society in which we find ourselves. Our summary for last week was that God works intergenerationally in families. That is a blessing. That's a great encouragement, or it should be, to us, especially those who have children. God works intergenerationally in families. You do not know how many desperate prayers I have prayed to God for my children. How many times in weeping I have fallen on my face before God for children as they were growing up who I felt were not obeying God through their parents who were walking in ways that were not pleasing to him, who were learning to be stubborn and rebellious and resistant and in spite of the fact that we'd spanked them. How thankful I am that God's word is true and that God works intergenerationally families. I still pray for my children. Certainly I do. And they are still sinners. <laughs> but I see the grace of God working in their lives. And how thankful I am for that. Parents never fail to pray for your children. Grandparents never fail to pray for your grandchildren. 
And if you have great-grandchildren, pray for your great-grandchildren and never give it up. I have an uncle for whom I prayed for 50 years before he trusted Christ. God works intergenerationally in families. And how thankful we are for that. And we gave some illustrations out of the two places where the Ten Commandments are found in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5, which state that for us. But just because he works in families does not mean that he will not chasten us when we repent. He still will bring chastening. And we saw illustrations of that with the children of Israel who died in the wilderness even after God forgave them. So our takeaway lesson from last week was, if you want your children and grandchildren to be blessed and to receive God's very best in their lives, now is the time for you personally to start living a holy, obedient, diligent, sacrificial, energetic life of service for Jesus Christ. We can't put it off till tomorrow. Now is the appointed day that God has made for us. We understand the principles. We can look at the past and we can't change it. We can repent from it. We can confess it as sin. We can move on and we can, by the grace of God, not go back to what it used to be. But it's time to start living a holy life now. If we want to see God's blessing on our children, on our posterity for generations yet to come. Move on in zealous obedience. We also saw a very wonderful principle in that text is that God was answering Moses' stubborn prayer before Moses made the request. He was already about to send Moses a helper. Verse 14, he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. Fascinating, because Aaron was already in Egypt and God didn't choose to use him. God sent him out in the desert to find Moses and he didn't argue, he obeyed. He was compliant. Aaron was a man that somehow miraculously got out of Egypt at a time when everybody who were Jews were slaves. God opened that door. But God hasn't told us how he did it. We saw that God answers our prayer requests even before we call on him. Isaiah 65, 24. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. God knows in advance what you're going to say. God is already in the process of answering and those prayer requests which are in harmony with his word and with his will and with his character are prayer requests that he will give a yes answer to. So make sure that's the way you pray. In harmony with his word, with his will, and with his character. Anything that you pray that is different from that will get a no answer from God. We learned the next great lesson of how God appoints the precise intersections in our lives with those who will make a difference in our lives. Nothing happens to you each day by accident. The people that God brings into your life are there for a purpose. What we need to learn to do is be attentive and sensitive to why God is bringing those people into our lives and make sure that we have the greatest possible impact on those people for Christ that we can. Be alert to that. You will have opportunities tomorrow. You will have opportunities on Tuesday. You will come into contact with somebody. Maybe it will be a teller at the bank. Maybe it will be somebody at the grocery store. Maybe it will be somebody in your business. Maybe it will be a fellow worker. Maybe it will be a client or a customer who comes into the office. God doesn't let accidents happen in the lives of believers. God brings those people into our lives. There is an intersection with our life and that person's life, and we may never see them again. Think of every contact that you have as a divine appointment from God himself. It changes the way you look at life. It changes the way you go through life in just sort of a humdrum, mundane kind of a lackadaisical way. Every intersection with the life of another person is a divine appointment from God. And then the final thing that we learned was that God sometimes chooses younger siblings in a family to accomplish greater things 
than the older sibling or siblings. And we saw that in the life of David. God chose the youngest son, even though seven older brothers were humanly superior. And that brings us to our lesson for today, Exodus 4.17. And thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs. <laughs> Some important key words in there. This rod, not another rod. Thine hand, not somebody else's hand. You're going to be the one that uses it. And you're not going to do what you want to do. You're going to do signs. A sign is something that God puts as a signpost to tell somebody else something. In this case, it was going to be to warn the Egyptians that there was a God in heaven who was greater than all the gods of Egypt. Moses, you're the sign bearer. You're the one that carries the rod of God. You are going to do something with what God gave you. Not put it away in a box. Not wrap it up because now it's holy. Not hide it in a shrine somewhere. You're going to do something with it. What are you doing with what God's put in your hand? You've got it wrapped up, hidden away in a bank account, stuck under the bed in a box someplace. What are you doing with what God gave you? I remember many years ago, uh, I used to be in Boy Scouts, and I can remember the troop leaders trying diligently to teach us how to survive off the land in case we ever got stranded. Didn't very often happen because there are always the <laughs> Boy Scout leaders around. But I mean, there was the possibility. They wanted to teach us how to be men, how to survive on our own out there in the wilderness whenever those horrible things would happen. And we'd dream about those horrible things happening and all the heroic things that we were going to do because we've been taught by our scout leaders. They taught us how to start a fire with sticks. They tried to teach us what things were edible and what things were poisonous. They tried to teach us the habits of the wild animals. They tried to teach us to fish and hunt for small game by making snares. They tried to teach us how to make a splint and bind an arm or a leg if somebody got a broken bone. They tried to teach us how to tell between poisonous snakes and harmless snakes and what to do in case of snake bite. In short, they tried to teach us how to use simple things at hand so that we would not die from stupidity, <laughs> as many people have in the wilderness. But you know, God also uses simple things. We've already looked at Moses' rod, which became the rod of God. We've already learned that God uses inadequate tools to prove that he alone is great. But today we want to look at some of the other simple things that God has used. And this list could go on almost infinitely because everything God has ever used is less than he and thus it is a simple thing. But we'll look at some of the ones that are given to us in the word of God. Things that God has used so that it will give us encouragement to know that he can use us for his glory. The theological statement of that, of course, is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25 and following, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen. Now, if you don't get it anywhere else, you get it here. God didn't choose you because you were wise and mighty and noble. But God does the choosing. God chose Moses. Moses was not going to get out of it. God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base, that means down at the bottom, things of the world and the things which are despised. The world looks at the Christians and they say, those idiot Christians. The things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not, 
to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. No room for pride, no room for glorying, no room for self-patting on the back, that God would get the glory and not man. Let's look at some of the simple things that God has used to accomplish some incredibly great things. The first one, recorded for us in the Bible, is that God uses dirt. God uses dirt. Genesis 2-7 And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. When you tend to get proud, remember where you came from. God used dirt. Something that most folks don't pick up on, maybe you have, and so I give you credit for that, but did you know that not just Adam was made from dirt? So were the land creatures. Genesis 1.24, And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so, and you say, well, yeah, that's just him creating. But look at chapter 2, verse 19. It expands on that. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. That's the reason that when both men and animals decay, they go back to dirt. Yes, God made man out of dirt, but Genesis chapter 2, verse 19 indicates to us that out of the ground, God made the animals too. Genesis 3, 19, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. In this same context, we find God using another simple thing. Actually, it's much more complex, perhaps, to us than you might imagine, even as dirt is a great deal more complex. But God uses a rib. Now, a rib is the only part of your body that can be removed, and it will regenerate. It will grow back again. God took a rib and made Eve. Genesis 2.20, And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to all the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. You realize that's the basis for marriage? Because the very next two verses are the foundational verses for marriage that Jesus quotes and says this is the way it's supposed to be. And this is the reason, all the way back in Genesis, why the sodomite so-called marriages are an abomination to God. Verses 24 and 25. Immediate context. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Because you see, originally they were one flesh. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. In this immediate context, we see God using something else. God used a snake. And we find out the reason why in the book of Numbers, as we'll see in just a moment. Genesis 3, 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. You know, God did not have to make snakes. He was under no obligation to make snakes. But God specifically chose to make a snake, even though he knew what was going to happen. 
God foreordained it. Because he was going to demonstrate his greatest glory by showing his mercy and his grace to a sinful creature, to Adam and to his posterity. Remember, God had already started working on Aaron even while Moses is jawing with God. And Aaron had already obeyed God, and Aaron was already moving and on his direction to the desert, while Moses was arguing with why God's plan was not such a good plan. God took a snake. And he, that is the serpent, said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and... Interesting. Dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. From what had God made man? Out of the dust of the earth. Verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And we know from the New Testament that that is a reference to Christ. And then it is fulfilled when we see the next phrase, It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That's what's called the Proto-Evangelium. The very first announcement of the gospel of salvation. It's used that way in the New Testament. The serpent bites the heel of the Lord Jesus, but the heel comes down and crushes the head of the serpent. And then we find the picture that is portrayed for us in Numbers chapter 21 with the serpent. God told Moses, make a serpent out of brass and put it upon a pole. You remember the fiery serpents were coming through the wilderness and the people were being bitten because they had been in rebellion against God and thousands of them were dying by snake bite in the wilderness. And they cried to Moses, intercede for us with God, we're dying right and left. God told Moses, make a serpent out of brass, stick it on a pole, put it up in the middle of the camp, and anybody who just looks at it will be healed. Well, I tell you, we don't have anything like that in Boy Scout training, <laughs> how to take care of snake bites. Anybody who just looks at it will be healed. And the people who looked were the people who had faith that it would work. There were probably people who thought, well, that's a nutty idea. I'm going to try to solve the problem another way. And they died. But the ones who by faith looked were healed. The serpent on a pole the New Testament tells us, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Speaking of the crucifixion of Christ, brass, the picture of judgment, the serpent, the picture of sin, taking us back to the Garden of Eden. And Christ bore it for us on the cross. God used the serpent did you know that God not only used Moses' rod, but God used Aaron's rod? The children of Israel, among their many murmurings and complainings in the wilderness, griped about the fact that Moses and Aaron were the only leaders. And hey, after all, that's nepotism. You know, two brothers running the organization. And so the leaders came and they said, hey, you take too much on you. We want to be leaders too. And God said, tell those guys... To every one of you, tomorrow morning, bring a rod here to the tabernacle. We'll lay them up before the Lord and see what God does. And he'll let us know which one he has chosen. Number 17, 5 and following. It shall come to pass that the man's rod, whom I shall choose, shall blossom. These are a bunch of dead sticks. And I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. And Moses spoke unto the children of Israel, and every one of the princes gave him a rod apiece, for each prince one, according to their father's houses, even twelve rods. And the rod of Aaron was among their rods. And Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. 
And it came to pass that on the morrow, Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded and brought forth buds and blossomed blossoms and yielded almonds. Now that's the fastest crop you ever saw in the Bible except on the days of creation. It budded. It had flowers. It produced almonds. So you know what kind of stick Moses or Aaron had chosen to be his staff in the wilderness. And Moses brought out all the rods from before the Lord unto all the children of Israel. And they looked, and every man took his rod. And the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony, to be kept for a token against the rebels, and thou shalt fight, take away their murmurings from me, that they die not. God used Aaron's rod to stop a rebellion. And God used it as a reminder in generation for it was brought into the tabernacle of testimony, placed in the Ark of the Covenant. We have three things there. We have Aaron's rod, the pot that budded, uh, the, the pot of manna, and the, the tables of the law. This is referred to over in the book of Hebrews. That's a long-range perpetual reminder about the danger of rebelling against God. The pot of manna reminds them of the provision of God. The tables of the law remind them of the authority of God. Three very important things that were laid up before the Lord. God uses birds. We see an illustration of the raven, and of course uh, we find that over in the book of Genesis where we see both the raven and the dove. It came to pass at the end of forty days that Noah opened the window of the ark which was made, and he sent forth a raven, which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from the face of the earth. He also sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abased from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no place for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were upon the face of the whole earth. And he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her into him into the ark. And he stayed yet another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came into him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from the earth. God used some birds. God used a raven in another occasion too, very clearly supernaturally. First Kings chapter 17, verses 1 and following. Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Boy, you'd better know you're from God when you make a statement like that. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And he it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook. Now listen. God's very clearly saying that he's going to use some birds. I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning. And bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank of the brook. Now I don't know if this has ever piqued your curiosity. But it has piqued my curiosity. I wonder where the ravens got that bread and meat. And it was probably not raw meat. God sent those birds to pick it up somewhere. And I sort of wonder if maybe it wasn't back there at the palace where Ahab was. And God is sort of sitting in the heavens and laughing at Ahab. I'm taking your food and I'm giving it to my prophet. <laughs> and God used a raven to do it. A dirty bird. But you know, Elijah was a man who was thankful for it. That's how God fed him. God uses animals like donkeys. Zechariah 9.9 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. And that's fulfilled for us in John chapter 12. Beginning in verse 12, on the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. Think back to the Garden of Eden for a moment. 
when God made those first donkeys. And then think to the ark when God chose two donkeys. And those donkeys had colts and so on through the generations for thousands of years until there was one day when there was a an ass and her colt tied up at a random location from man's point of view with owners other than Jesus or the disciples and God chooses a donkey and the owners let it go and Jesus that donkey carried God the Son into Jerusalem does God use little things does God use insignificant things God used locusts Exodus chapter 10 and Moses and Aaron came in unto Pharaoh and said unto him thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews how long wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before me let my people go that they may serve me else if thou refuse to let my people go behold tomorrow I will bring the locusts into thy coast and they shall cover the face of the earth that one cannot be able to see the earth and they shall eat the residue of that which is escaped which remaineth to you of the hail and they shall eat every tree which groweth out unto you out of the field and down in verse 12 Pharaoh won't do it and the Lord said unto Moses stretch out thine hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land even all the hail hath left and Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. And the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested in all the coasts of Egypt. Very grievous were they. Before them there were no such locusts as they. Neither after them shall be such. For they covered the face of the whole earth, so that the land was darkened. And they did eat every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. And there remained not any green thing in the trees or in the herbs of the field throughout all the land of Egypt. Now out here in the western part of the United States, there have been great locust clouds that have devoured many fields on occasions. And they're sometimes two to three miles wide and five to eight miles long. This covered the entire land of Egypt. That is the largest locust plague and it came precisely on schedule at the command of God to destroy every green thing in Egypt. A locust may be small, but God has at his disposal every locust in the world. And God has at his disposal every wind in the world. And God can put the two together when he wants and bring a judgment as he did. As we look at those plagues, and we'll look at them more in detail, I just mentioned the one, but as you look at the creatures used by God in the ten plagues of Egypt, you see God using small things. Frogs, those are not big. Lice, those are teeny tiny. Flies, locusts, other natural things, the water to blood, cattle disease, boils, hail, darkness, death. God uses what appear to be little things, but God can use them in powerful ways that bring himself the glory. Let's look at more. Fish, Jonah chapter 1 verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And of course we know the reason for that was because that was a picture, a type, a symbol of the resurrection of Christ, which was yet to come in the New Testament. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, the Son of Man was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Which, by the way, indicates that there is three days and three nights. It's not part of one day, a full day, and part of another day. You can work that back from Sunday. 
God uses stones. 1 Samuel 17, 48. It came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand into the bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. And then you know how David runs over, takes Goliath's own sword and cuts off his head. God used a little rock. You've heard people say, oh, he's dumb as a rock. Just remember, God uses even little rocks, dumb rocks, to do great things. Salt, God used salt. Second Kings chapter 2, verse 19. And the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord seeth, but the water is naught, and the ground barren. And he said, Bring me a new cruise, and put salt therein. And they brought it to him. And he went forth unto the spring of waters and cast the salt in there and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from henceforth any more death or barren land. And the waters were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, which he spake. Now you and I would look at that and we'd say, Salt, if you put salt into water, it makes it salty and that makes it undrinkable. God uses things in ways that we could not imagine because we would think that the outcome would be different than what the outcome actually is. And that's what proves God is great and that God is glorious and that God is the one who determines the end from the beginning. God not only used salt, did you know God used bears? We find over 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 23. And he went up from thence unto Bethel, and as he was going up by the way, there came forth little children out of the prophet and mocked him and said, Go up, thou bald head, go up, thou bald head. Elijah has just been taken to heaven in the, uh, the chariot in the, uh, the whirlwind, and um, the chariot separates between him and Elisha. And so the, the kids, and the word used here is like young teenagers. Some of you out here are young teenagers, a bunch of little hoodlums. Uh, you aren't little hoodlums, but uh, these were little hoodlums. And they're mocking him. Oh, let's see you do it too. Come on, come on. We heard about Elijah going up and you gave that story. Let's see you do it too. Go up, thou bald head. Go up, bald head. And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood and tear forty and two children of them. And he went from thence to Mount Carmel and from thence he returned to Samaria. Be careful, young people, at who you mock. Be careful because you may be challenging God. God used a rooster. Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Down thirty verses later, forty verses later, Peter remembered the words of Jesus which he said unto him, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. You know, God gave Peter a forewarning so that he wouldn't do that. Because Mark tells us that Jesus told you it would happen twice. So when you hear the first one, it should wake you up that you're on the wrong path. Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee, this is Mark 14, 30, that this day, even this night, so you're not going to mistake it for some time in the future, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. 42 verses later. The second time the cock crew and Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said unto him. He heard it the first time, but he didn't pay attention. He remembered the word that Jesus said unto him before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And when he thought thereon, he wept. It was too late. God uses little things. God uses simple things. Let me give you an illustration of where God used a specific lion. 1 Kings chapter 13. You recall there has been a a prophet who was told to go and warn them at the, the false otter that Jeroboam had set up, and he did, and 
Jeroboam, when he says, hey, you know, seize that guy, this is Jeroboam II. He says, uh, seize that guy, and he sticks out his hand, and his hand withers up, and he says, pray to God, and that I'll be healed. And the prophet prays, and the Lord heals his hand, and so on. And so Jeroboam says, hey, you know, come home and have dinner with me. And uh, the prophet says, I can't do it. God told me to come up here and go back and not eat anything in between. He heads on his way back. There is an old compromising prophet there who uh, sends somebody after him and says, hey, you run after him and tell him to come back here and tell him, you know, the word of the Lord came to me and told me that, hey, it's okay now. You can go back and eat with the prophet. So he does. He goes back, and the word of the Lord comes to that very compromising prophet and says to him, you know, God told you not to do this, and you just did it. The very guy who's compromised, who has never stood up against Jeroboam, who has never said peep or boo about the false altar that's there, God speaks through him. He says, because this happened to you, you're not going to get home. You came back and ate like God told you not to do. You drank because then God told you not to do. Part of the problem was, of course, on his way back, he hadn't gone straight back. He sat down to rest. He didn't finish his whole job before he took his rest. And so he gets on his donkey and he heads back home. And a lion comes out and kills him. And the lion doesn't touch the donkey and the donkey doesn't run away from the lion. And the lion just sits there by the carcass. And that's what brings us to verse 23. And he went up from thence unto Bethel, and as he was going up by the way, there came forth... Excuse me, wrong, wrong passage. And, and as men passed by, behold, they saw the carcass cast in the way, First Kings 13. Cast in the way, and the lion standing by the carcass, and they came and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. And when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, It is the man of God who was disobedient unto the word of the Lord... Therefore the Lord hath delivered him unto the lion, which hath torn him and slain him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake unto him. Folks, that should cause us great pause to think about disobedience. Even just to think about it, much less to do it. You know what God wants you to do. It has been declared in his word, and then you go out and you do it. That is a dangerous thing to do. God killed him for it. He used the lion to do it. God uses cows. 1 Samuel chapter 6. The ark of the Philistines was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do to the ark of the Lord? Tell us wherewith we shall send it to his place. And they said, If you send the ark of God of Israel, send it not empty, but in any wise return him a trespass offering, that you may be healed. And it shall be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Then said they, What shall the trespass offering be? What we will return to him. They answered, Five golden emeralds, five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines, for one plague was on you all and on your lords. God, in their case, we didn't talk about that, but you could add it here. God used mice, which overran those five Philistine cities, and God gave them all hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids is the way it's translated in the text. Yeah, God uses simple things. Wherefore then do you harden your hearts, as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? They had heard the stories. When he had wrought wonderfully among them, did they not let the people go and they departed? Now take a new cart, take two milk kine, that's two milk cows, on which has never come a yoke, tie them to the cart, and bring their calves home from them. So they've never pulled a cart before, so they won't know what they're supposed to do. And take away their calves from them, and you know where they're going to go? They're going to go after their calves, unless there's something supernatural about this. And take the ark of the Lord and lay it upon the cart and put the jewels of gold which you returned to him for a trespass offering in a coffer by the side thereof and send it away that it may go. And see, if it goeth by the way of his own coast to Beth Shemesh, then he hath done us this great evil. But if not, then ye shall know that it is not his hand that smote us. It was a chance that happened to us. And the men did so, and they took two milk kine and tied them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. And they laid the ark of the Lord upon the cart and the coffer with the mice of gold and the images of their emeralds. And the kine took the straight way to the way of Beth Shemesh and went along the highway, lowing as they went. They were not happy about it. They turned not aside to the right hand or to the left, and the lords of the Philistines went after them under the border of Beth Shemesh. God uses cows to demonstrate who he is. 
The gourd, the worm, the east wind, you know it out of the story of Jonah. The Lord God prepared a gourd and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. But God prepared a worm. God uses worms. He did also with Herod, who died and was eaten by worms. When the morning rose the next day, and he smote the gourd that it withered, and it came to pass when the sun did arise, God prepared a vehement east wind. God prepares a gourd. God prepares a worm. God prepares a, a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished himself to die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. God said unto Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he says, I do well to be very angry, even unto death. Come on, kill me. <laughs> oh, how we thank God for his mercy. Then said the Lord, Thou hast pity on the gourd, for which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow. It came up in a night, it perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? We can go on, our time is up at this point, but the storm on the Sea of Galilee, which Jesus stills, God sent that storm. Jesus withered a fig tree. We find the pigs plunging into the lake. We find the many miracles of Christ. We find the aprons and the claws from the body of the Apostle Paul. God uses simple things. God uses little things. Just remember, if God can use dirt to make a man, if God can speak through a donkey, he can make you into the man or woman that he wants you to be, and he can speak through you. We close with Balaam. Numbers 22, 21. Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. And God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass and his two servants were with him. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way. His sword drawn in his hand, and the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field. And Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. But the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself into the wall and crashed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he smote her again. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with a staff. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass. God was going to open Moses' mouth too. Moses was just like the ass. And she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee, that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me. It didn't ever occur to him the donkey's talking to him. He was so mad, it didn't click. This is not what donkeys usually do. <laughs> because thou hast mocked me, I would there were a sword in mine hand, for now I would kill thee. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am not I thine ass, upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was unto this day? Was I ever wont to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam. Oh, that God might open our eyes to see where we are disobeying him. For he doesn't have to use a donkey to teach us. The Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face, and you and I would too. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me. Dear friends, is your way perverse before God? Be warned, the angel of death may be standing in your way. And it may take a donkey 
to get you back on the right path. And the ass saw me and turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely also I had slain thee and saved her alive. Just remember, if God can use dirt to make a man, if God can speak through a donkey, he can make you into the man or the woman, the boy or the girl that he wants you to be. And he can speak through you. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. How we thank you that you use little things, you use simple things, you use things that we're familiar with, and you do incredible, powerful things with them. Because you are God and you are the one who gets the glory when you use the insignificant tool. For in your hand, it can accomplish that which glorifies you. Father, we pray that you will take this, your word, which we have heard this morning, that you will use it in our hearts. Bring us to repentance, to confess it as sin, to turn around and go the other way, that we might be pleasing to you in all that we do, all that we say. All the divine intersections in our lives so that Jesus Christ will be glorified. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number five.